So um, I want to um, take a moment to introduce our distinguished speaker today, my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Eileen Fowler. Um, just by way of background, Dr. Fowler holds numerous titles, um, including faculty member in the Tarzan Center. Um, she's also the Director of Research and Education for the Center for Cerebral Palsy at the UCLA Orthopedic Institute for Children in the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. She holds the Peter William Shapiro Chair for the Center for Cerebral Palsy, and she is the Director of the Cameron Gate and Motion Analysis Laboratory. Um, she also holds many distinctions, including um, an appointment in 2016 as the President of the American Academy of Cerebral Palsy um, and Developmental Medicine, and she's a member of the Scientific Advisory Council for the CP Foundation. Um, Dr. Fowler has over 30 years of experience in the evaluation and treatment of patients with neuromuscular disorders, um, particularly cerebral palsy and Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Her research program focuses on the neural and biomechanical factors associated with functional impairments. And today she's going to be presenting really cutting edge research on um, examining the influence of reduced selective motor control and plasticity in children with spastic CP using clinical, biomechanical, and neural imaging approaches. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Eileen Fowler. Good morning, everyone. Um, so we're, I'm going to be talking about skilled lower extremity motor development in children with a form of cerebral So um, selective motor control is another word, word for skilled movement of the lower extremities for those that are in this area, um, legs. Uh, I'm going to be talking about clinical assessment that we developed, um, mirroring, which is sort of an abnormal um, movement that we see in children with cerebral palsy, uh, biomechanical assessment of selective motor control, and then um, our camp leg power, which is an intervention that we developed to, um, to target selective motor control. And I'm going to discuss motor outcomes and brain imaging outcomes from that study. So um, spastic cerebral palsy is an injury to the developing brain, and it's associated with premature birth and low birth weight. It's a developmental disability, so the child is, um, it occurs before or um, around the time of birth most commonly. Um, so it affects the development of the child and their motor system in particular. And there's uh, many impairments associated with cerebral palsy, and here's some um, that are very common. Obviously, spastic cerebral palsy is what I'm talking about, so there's lots of focus on spasticity. Um, also, weakness that occurs. Uh, impaired balance, and there's a lot of evaluations and ways to look at these things, but there really wasn't a focus on selective motor control. Um, and so that is an area that we decided to do um, our research in. So selective voluntary motor control we're defining as the ability to perform isolated joint movements upon request without using mass flexor and extensor patterns. And that's sort of the kicking motion you'd see in an infant. They don't have very skilled movement when they kick. It's sort of the whole leg uh, flexes and the whole leg extends. And then without undesired movement at other joints such as mirroring. So I'm going to be talking a lot about corticospinal tracts, and these are the tracts that control voluntary motor control. And if we're looking at this child's face, um, facing up, um, if we took a cross section through his brain in this position, this is a schematic representation that you see on this side. So the corticospinal tracts, of course, on each side of these dark areas here are called the ventricles. And uh, the ones that course closer to the ventricles are the foot and ankle and the hip and knee. And that anatomical arrangement is important because um, when there's an injury to these corticospinal tracts, um, it affects the um, it, the knee and ankle tracts, for example, are more vulnerable because they're closer to this red area of damage, which can occur bilaterally, but I'm just showing it on one side. Um, so the corticospinal tracts are um, commonly injured in spastic CP. It's often called white matter. So these tracts are white matter tracts of prematurity. And um, one of the diagnostic terms from uh, magnetic resonance imaging uh, is PVL or periventricular leukomalacia. So if we look at the ventricles, um, 
peri means around the ventricles, and leuco is white, Malaysia is bad. So it really means bad white matter around the ventricles in Latin. So these tracks are responsible for voluntary movement, which includes force, speed, timing, and pattern of movement. And again, these distal structures, the foot and the ankle, as compared to the hip and the knee, are more vulnerable to injury. And most of the children that I study are children who can walk, so that's very important for us. If you have more damage, then it would involve the, um, the upper extremity and the trunk. And mirroring is, is, um, occurs when there's ipsilateral tract preservation. So we all know if somebody has a stroke on like the left side of the brain, that that causes an impairment on the right side, like a right hemiplegia. So these corticospinal tracts um, are also in, injured in stroke and perinatal stroke as well. And so one side of the body uh, um, controls the tracts on the opposite side. And so, but in an infant, there's bilateral control. So there's ipsilateral on the same side and contralateral control of the limbs. But as the child develops and these tracts myelinate, then the ipsilateral control is extinguished and this contralateral control is strengthened. So, uh, but in, when there's an injury, this does not happen. So sometimes um, there's bilateral control and that can lead to mirroring. So that means if I, for example, if I'm talking about the upper extremity, if I bend or flex my right elbow, then the left elbow is constrained to move. So they have to move together and they can't, it's obligatory, they can't um, stop it from happening. And so you can imagine that that's something that can be very disrupted to especially something like walking. So um, this is, again, if we have more damage, then we're going to be taking out more of these tracks. Now there's a lot of clinical assessments to look at skilled movement of the upper extremity. We typically call it fine motor movement when we're evaluating children. So here's eight of them that I came up with right away when looking them up. But there weren't any to look at the lower extremity. So we developed one in our laboratory called SCALE, which is Selective Control Assessment of a Lower Extremity. And we don't think about the lower extremity as being skilled, but if you've seen, uh, you know, skilled ballet dancers, for example, or um, soccer players, we know that we see a lot of skill in the feet and the ankle and the whole lower extremity in these athletes. So we wanted this to be a simple clinical tool because if it's not simple, then it won't be performed uh, as frequently and not sort of adapted into the um, clinic. So it takes only 10 to 15 minutes to complete. We ask the patient to perform selective movement for um, lower extremity joints. Each joint is graded separately. So we, we evaluate the hip, knee, ankle, subtalar joint, which moves the foot in and out, and the toes. And there's a zero score if there's no movement at all or if the only way the child can move is to move in one of those obligatory synergy patterns. Um, and one for impaired and two is normal. So it's fairly simple. Um, and the maximum score for the lower limb is 10 points. So five joints times two, so you get 10 points. And obligatory mirroring is a common reason for an impaired score. So I'm gonna show you um, just example of how we do this at the knee. It's sort of a simple joint to observe. And um, this here is asking this um, with cerebral palsy to extend, flex, and extend the left knee and not to move the rest of their body and not to move the right limb. So what do you think about that? That looks pretty good, doesn't it? So that got a two score, a normal score. So next we're looking at somebody with impaired selective motor control at the knee and we're asking again just to move the left leg and let's see what happens. It went to the next one. That's what happens. <laughs> Here we go. Okay, and so we can see movement, especially you see the mirror movement on the other side. And when that happens, we, you know, again, explain what we want and um, have them try again. So that's obligatory movement. And then this is a child that doesn't have any evidence of selective motor. Ask her to move just the left leg and just extend the knee and, you know, go through that passive 
so she can whole leg in pattern. And this child is able to walk with the walker, and you really wouldn't appreciate this, the difference between these children if you saw them walk. So it's something that um, only can be evaluated in examination like this, but yet it's a very important um, factor, we feel, that predicts how well they're going to do. Um, then also, uh, our next question was, we're trying to see if it's evaluate the corticospinal tracts. So if it does, then we see greater impairment at the knee. And here's the mean score for each joint, with a maximum of two. And if we look at these average scores across the joints, we can see that there's a significant downward trend. So indeed, we are able to see that this clinical measure does capture um, that increased vulnerability. Also interested in looking at uh, quantifying mirroring in a little bit more depth, this sort of maladaptive plasticity. Studies have focused extremity and found this with in animal studies that there is this preservation of ipsilateral corticospinal tracts but less is known about the lower extremity and also about bilateral CP. So this is critical for function if we're looking at walking which requires interlimb coordination. So we had 47 children with cerebral palsy that had bilateral CP in both legs it's sometimes called spastic diplegia and we found that over 50 of them exhibited mirroring at one or both knees and 26% at the ankle. So that's a pretty high proportion of patients that have this abnormal um, impairment. So what we decided to do next was to prevent mirroring during an during a exercise task. So here on the lower where you have a, a machine that's going to measure the um, the torque, and torque is like the force of the muscles, but it's rotational, so we call it torque rather than force, and it's measured in newton meters. So if this child has low motor control, and we're asking him, in this side, we leave the leg unconstrained, but in this side we constrain the leg, so we really can't mirror on the other side, and we're looking at how much torque is developed in the limb that's exercising. And you can see that significantly is reduced when we don't allow that mirroring. So that's very, shows that it's very hardwired. And if we look at a child um, that has good motor control, that did not show mirroring on our, our scale score in our clinical exam, you can see that um, that there isn't that reduction that when we constrain this movement, there is a little bit of movement here that occurs. You know, she's sort of wiggling around. It's not a quite clear mirroring. And it's pretty strong. When we have uh, the kids exercise, sometimes I accidentally stand in the way of that leg and you get a pretty good kick. <laughs> so it's very strong. But there isn't any reduction in her torque. And when we looked at um, a larger group of children, we found if we looked at the average and the peak um, torque in the unconstrained versus the constrained condition, we can see a difference for the group that mirrored on our clinical examination, but we didn't see a difference between the group that did not. So we did find clinical evidence of corticospinal um, tract impairment um, that we could capture with our clinical measure scale. There was greater distal impairment, and then also the mirroring experiment suggests that neural drive from one hemisphere is controlling bilateral muscle groups. So now we looked at this sort of just with, with patients sitting. What about if we can get them up and moving? We know that we need selective motor control for skilled lower extremity movement. Uh, walking and kicking are um, excellent ways of studying this. Um, when somebody's standing on their limb, there's a lot of other factors that come into play. They need balance, uh, for example. Um, so we're studying this, this uh, interjoint coordination during the swing phase of gait. So here, you can see normally with it, someone who has good motor control, they flex the hip and extend the knee. So they can dis dissociate movement. It's not just in a pattern. But with children with poor motor control, they sort of walk in a, in a more of a marching pattern. 
and can also appreciate with something like kicking, which is a very common childhood activity for participation in sport, that if a child wants to kick, they need to first extend their hip and flex their knee, and then to get ready to, in preparation, and then in the follow through of a kick, they need to flex the hip and extend the knee. And these children with cerebral palsy are unable to do that. So we can look at it in our gait lab and it's easier to look at just the limbs here. We got rid of all the clothing and um, the, the muscles and skin so we can get a better look at what's going on at the joints. So this is uh, somebody without cerebral palsy that has normal selective motor control. And I want you to just focus on the swing phase and you should see the hip flexes and then you get rapid extension of the knee. So you get full extension of the knee right before the leg touches the floor. And that gives you a good step length. So here's an example of how the um, foot hits the floor with good hip flexion and knee extension. You get a, an adequate step length here. Now if we look at someone with impaired selective motor control walking that has CP, you can see that you don't get that nice full rapid extension of the knee before the foot hits the floor. So it's still in a little bit of flexion. And because of that, we have a shortened step length. And then if we look at our um, child with an absence of selective motor control that has a zero score for the limb, we see this marching pattern. So in this marching pattern, there's a very markedly reduced step length. So that's one outcome is step length that we can look at. We're also interested in how could we measure this coordination between the hip and the knee. And since our area is biomechanics, we came up with a biomechanical way of looking at it. Um, this is a nice way of sort of appreciating it in that we're going from scale score of one to three to four to six to eight to 10, which is normal. And that um, if this is knee flexion and hip flexion, that when somebody has very poor motor control, they kind of move together. Sort of the, the hip flexes, the knee flexes. So they kind of go in that kind of diagonal. As, as the um, scale score improved, you see the more opening up of that angle and more dissociation. And then when you get to a score here, this is somebody without cerebral palsy. So you see that the knee flexes and extends during stance. And then the swing phase that I'm really interested in to, for step length is when the hip is in flexion here and the knee is rapidly extending. So that's what we're interested in looking at. Unfortunately, this is a really nice way to understand it, um, but it's a quantitative measure. And if you want to do research, you need and statistics. So we needed some numbers. So I'm not going to expect you to go through every step here, but we used some trigonometry. And this is a hip angle. This is when the foot hits the floor. So this is the stance phase and the swing phase. So we're looking at one leg. So the hip extends and then flexes. And then this is the knee. And this is abnormal graph with child with cerebral palsy. So we took this and we created the sort of um, velocity versus angle. We calculated the inverse tangent to get a phase angle. And then we subtracted the um, knee phase angle uh, with the hip phase angle from the knee uh, phase angle. And we ended up with this plot, which is a relative phase. And this is the minimum relative phase. So you're going to have to take my word for it that if this is 180 degrees minus 180, it means that the hip and the knee are completely dissociated from one another. So during swing, when that hip is flexed and the knee's extending, that's sort of a dis dis independent coordination. And this being close to 180 means that, means that that's occurring. And then if we look at, again, we're just looking at the swing phase here. If we look here, here is a, here is a child without disability scale score of four and a scale score of zero. So we can see that this sort of does capture the, the um, coordination of the hip and the knee. And if we see if this correlates with our clinical measure, which is our scale score, we can see that here, scale score from zero to 10, as 
scale score increases and selective motor control increases, this minimum relative phase decreases and becomes closer to 180. And so this is a very significant relationship and strong relationship. So that was also very encouraging to see that not only did this clinical evaluation predict how somebody moved um, in exercise conditions or um, just in evaluation, it also has some relationship to natural movement. So then we wanted to know, does it have anything to do with telling us which child might do better if for certain kind of treatments? Because that's important. Why do you, you know, do these measures? You want to know, is something going to be sensitive? Does it have um, sensitivity to change? So we looked at hamstring lengthening surgeries. So what happens with children with cerebral palsy is as they grow, muscles have spasticity and do not have extensibility. So their bones grow, but the muscles don't stretch. So what happens when your muscles get tight with your hamstring? If I go to stretch my hamstring, am I able to get my knees straight? No. Well, these children, um, they get so tight and the bone, when the bones grow that they can't stand straight because the hamstrings are so tight. They develop what's called a contracture, so a knee flexion contracture. So hamstring lengthening is the orthopedic surgeons actually go in and they do a cut into the muscle and then they lengthen the muscle so that they can get, the child is able to get their knees straight. So that's very helpful in stance because if you're crouched like this and you extend, that's extending my hip and my knee at the same time, right? So they all improve with that. But we had a suspicion that maybe they weren't always improving when it came to extending their knee to put their foot down. And that's because you can make a muscle longer, but that doesn't mean you're giving it better neural control. So now the muscle's longer, but they don't have that neural control to be able to flex the hip and extend the knee. So I'm going to show you um, case examples. This, is, this has been published for two patients. And this graph is just to show you that they're pretty similar, that um, we, one's male and one's female. Um, they're a similar age, similar time between their pre-op and their post-op analysis. This is a mobility level, and what three means is that they both either use crutches or canes, that they can't walk without crutches or canes. And they have the same spasticity score. So that's a measure of how tight they are. So here's our first child pre-op, and he has poor motor control. here. Trying to get this video. There it is. Lost my arrow. There we go. So you can see he kind of has that marching pattern. But his knees are flexed during stance and then he takes short steps two things that we see with tight hamstrings. So now afterwards, he's had his hamstring surgery, and it's over a year later, and we can see, first of all, he's much straighter, isn't he? When he stands, he can get that knee straighter. Um, and when he takes steps, his knee gets nice and straight during stance, but he's not really taking bigger steps. And I'm gonna show you the actual numerical values for that. So this is a child with good motor control, and here she is before her hamstring surgery. And it almost looks oh, like a worse gait pattern in terms of the amount of flexion she has. She's very flexed. So having good motor control or poor motor control doesn't predict who's going to have more severe uh, contractures. You get them regardless of motor control. But here's her post-op. She's, again, nice and straight in stance, but you can see that she can get her leg out straight before she puts it down. Hard to see when they're moving quickly, but we do measure these things in our gait laboratory. And so when we looked post hamstring lengthening, we found that this, this first patient with poor motor control, low scale scores of two and three, did not improve um, step length and stride length. And our patient um, with good motor control, the second patient, was able to improve pre to post. So this 
Okay. For this is if the goal is to improve stride length, good selective motor control is required. And our studies have shown that you need probably a scale score of five or greater in order to show improvement. We also did some gait training um, with physical therapy intervention, and this is robotic gait training. So this is a robot that we have in our laboratory, and this is a child that's walking, and this robot is taking her through the walking pattern. And this is sometimes used to do training with children for their gait patterns, and um, also may be used uh, postoperatively as well. But we were using it to try and look at selective motor control. So with this child, we were asking her to, the robot is moving her passively, and we're asking her to kick as hard as she could with knee extension, so to really try and forcefully kick her knee straight during the swing phase of gait. And what we find is children who have good motor control are able to have this negative, which means hip flexion, with knee extension positive. So they're able to have um, flexion and extension occurring at the same time or uncoupled moments. But our um, patients with poor motor control were unable to do this. Whenever they tried to extend the knee, the hip extended as well. And we're, there are sensors in here that actually we can measure the joint torque so we know what kind of torque they're producing. And if we looked at this, we're looking at, um, on the top again, is a patient with good motor control in green. If we look at both the left and the right limb, we see high scale scores and we see an improvement in step length. So that child responded to our intervention. This child with poor motor control had scale scores of three and two. We actually saw you know, no change or a loss in um, decreased step length. And that child was a non-responder. So, so now we've gone through, you know, that we found that our, our clinical measure did correlate with what we know about corticospinal tracts and that it is predictive of natural movement and that um, can be prognostic for who might improve with a physical therapy intervention and also for an orthopedic surgery intervention. So the next thing we wanted to know is, can we improve lower extremity motor function and corticospinal tract outcomes with an intervention? So we designed an intervention and we called it Camp Leg Power. And um, it was a short-term intensive therapy and that is appropriate for teaching a skill. So what we're trying to do is teach a skill. In physical therapy, if we're trying to improve strength or we're trying to improve endurance, we couldn't do that in 15 sessions one month probably. We need three months. We know if you go to the gym, you don't see a change right away. But for teaching a skill, like for swimming, for example, I used to teach swimming a long time ago, and if you want to teach someone to swim, you're better off having them come every day for a couple of weeks than you are to have them come once a week for a long period of time. So we're trying to teach this skilled movement. So we had 15 sessions um, of intensive over a one month period for three hours a day. They weren't exercising every minute of the three hours a day. It was a camp. Um, and it was a, a real kind of camp. We had a camp t-shirt. We had a camp song. And we really made it fun. We had some arts and crafts activities as well. All the children in camp um, were able to walk and they had spastic cerebral palsy. And we performed selective motor control exercises with them that were high dose and challenging. And we also included sensory experiences. We took off their braces and had them experience walking in grass and sand because the children oftentimes put their braces on in the morning and don't take them off when they go to bed at night. So if we want to improve motor function in somebody's ankle and foot, really can't do it in, in a brace. Um, so we, we took them off and uh, it also was a sensory motor, this also damaged the sensory um, part of the brain as well. So we thought that was an important component. And the outcomes were measures of motor ability, uh, parent perception, and also we did brain imaging of the corticospinal tracts. So we did this over three summers. Um, 
the children, ambulatory means they're able to walk with spastic cerebral palsy between the ages of five and 17 years old. We had 23 children who participated in the study. And um, they were a fairly diverse group. We had 16 that uh, self-reported as being white, um, and six of those had Hispanic ethnicity. There were four Asian, two black, and one of mixed race. There, um, we did perform brain imaging data for a subset of children, and we wanted to have a more homogeneous group because you also can have cerebral palsy and have um, like an infection that might cause it or other or damage to your brain from like a traumatic birth. So we wanted it to be a homogeneous group. So um, they needed to have bilateral CP and be born premature with this PVL, which is damage to the corticospinal tracts, on MRI. They need to be able to lie still and meet the criteria for MRI. And just this will tell you right here why we only have 12 participants with CP that could do this. Um, in order to, uh, since it's research, if you're going to have an MRI in your child with cerebral palsy, you would be sedated probably, especially if you're a young child, so that you could lie still and get a good image. Um, but you can't do that for research purposes. So um, they can't. They have to be able to lie still, so we had them practice, and many children could not lie still, especially with an MRI. If any of you had an MRI before, yeah? And so what, what's, what's disturbing about the MRI? The noise. Claustrophobic also, claustrophobia. <laughs> and also the noise, and children with cerebral palsy also startle. They have more of a startle reflex than you or I would have. So that eliminated a lot of children. They can't have something called a back thumb pump. So a, a pump is something that is implanted. Some people have them that have diabetes you might be more familiar with. But it delivers antispasticity medication to the spinal cord. And so if you have a pump and you have an MRI, it is compatible with the MRI, but it, it turns off the programming. So that's not good, so they couldn't be in it. And then also shunts. A lot of children also had hydrocephalus, and they have a shunt, and a shunt is programmable, and the MRI interferes with the shunt. So, and a lot of children have orthopedic surgery that I just talked about. And sometimes they have surgeries where the legs turn in as well, and they have to have um, osteotomies where they need to cut the bone and turn like the leg out, and they have plates, and they have screws. They have also screws sometimes to prevent the growth on one side of one leg versus the other so that they'll be more symmetrical. So there are many reasons to have um, metal. So we, we finally had 12 children with cerebral palsy from our cohort of 23 who could participate pre-post in our brain imaging data. And we used a Prisma 3T scanner, for those of you who know about scanners. And we also matched them with 12 typically developing children in the same age range. So this is showing you uh, some of our camp. We did motor practice. So the child here on the left is, we're trying to get him to practice extending that knee while holding the hip still and kicking a ball. And here we're working on increasing step length. walk and exercise and different structure, uh, different kinds of textures. Um, and some of the children uh, did, did very much disliked walking in sand or, or grass or any kind of different texture when we first started. Uh, and then also we exercised all joints, including the toes. I really hadn't performed a lot of toe exercise with children before. But we're doing fun activities like trying to paint with a paintbrush with your toes. So we did silly things as well. Um, and then we told the children, like, you're having me do this exercise, but I can't do it. So what we're telling them is that we're also looking at what the brain is if the, is changed to the brain. So the first part of it is you have to think about it. So you have to really think about it. And even if you can't do exactly what we're saying in the way that we want you to, you're still exercising those brain tracks, and we might see a change. Uh, then we had some very high dose um, <clears throat> and challenging exercises. So here's this biodex I showed you before, someone exercising on with the mirroring experiment. So we took them through a range of speeds. Um, children with per motor control could not go at the highest speed to begin with, which is 300 degrees per second. It's very rapid movement. Um, so we exercised them. We brought them up to where they could just barely produce a torque and kind of stayed in that area and focused on that. So they did that for each knee. 
every day. They got feedback from a little exercise guy on the screen. And then this was their favorite. This is an ankle robot. So this, um, the, the foot is strapped into a moving component and they're playing a game with the computer here. So when this child dorsiflexes his ankle or brings his toes up towards his face, then that means that this paddle moves up. And when he plantar flexes or points his toes, the paddle moves down. So here we can see the ball coming, so if he dorsiflex, he can get there in time. And it's, it's interactive, so if he does well and he can meet that ball, then the speed will be increased. So it's, it's high dose, but it also continues that challenge into pro progressing to the highest level. And there's about 15 different games that you could play. So this is, um, was really very reinforcing for the kids. And if we looked at reps per session, they were over 300 was the average we had for these kids for the left and the right ankle. Which if I asked a child to exercise their right or left ankle, um, you know, I might get 20, you know, and they'd kind of be looking around. So they were really focusing and they didn't know they were exercising. So that's the best way to get kids to exercise is when they think it's play. Um, so then after we finished the camp, we had three months where they, um, we wanted to look at home exercise program to see if we could maintain what they had gained. So um, they performed a selective motor control exercise with their parents at least three times per week is what we asked for. And um, there were isolated joint motion of the hip, knee, ankle, subtalar joint, and toe joints. And this is kind of showing that the ankle, dorsiflexing and plantar flexing. We gave them illustrations and written exercises and their adherence was an average of 2.6 times. So that was pretty good. So what were our outcomes? So we, we measured, um, we had our outcome measures that we performed before we started camp, at the end of camp, and then after four months follow up. We looked at parent perception of change. The parents gave us their goals. This is a standardized measure that we used. They gave us their goals for what they wanted their child to achieve in camp, and then we asked them how, um, whether or not they, got better at this activity, they rated how well they did it, and then also how satisfied they were. We measured walking speed over a short distance, also walking endurance with a six minute walk. We looked at gross motor function, which is a lot of activities. We asked them to go up and down stairs, hop, stand on one leg, kick a ball, step over a stick, lots of different activities. Uh, and then knee strength and power on the Biodex machine that I showed you. And for this, we grouped them into high and low scale scores. And then we did our statistical analysis. So this just shows you where there's an asterisk. We saw improvement. So we saw pre-post improvement and at follow-up for our parent perspective. We did not see it for our 10 meter walk run. So we saw that the first year during camp, so then we added the endurance. We thought, well, maybe if we did a longer timed walk, we might see a difference. And indeed we did. We saw improvement post and a follow-up for the six minute walk test. And then also we saw the same improvements for the gross motor function test. This is um, looking at knee joint extensor torque. This is for the left leg, and we had similar results for the right. Um, again, we trained everyone in these speeds, we, and this is isometric and low speed. So this is sort of a no training area. So this blue is our high scale score group. The, the solid um, dark is pre, the hatched is post, and then the light blue is the maintenance. And we found statistical improvement from pre to post for all speeds where they trained. We didn't see it in the no training zone, which is interesting, so it shows specificity of training. And then we also saw maintenance for most of these speeds, all but one. When we looked at the low scale score groups, the first thing that's very apparent, they're in red, is they can't produce nearly as much torque, can they, at their knee. And when we look at their changes pre-post, we saw fewer changes, but again, they can't produce so much torque up here to begin with. And then we saw fewer areas where they maintained. <laughs>
So in summary for our motor function outcomes, we saw improvements in parental perception, walking endurance, gross motor function, and knee joint strength and power. And better selective motor control led to improvement at more speeds and greater maintenance and follow-up. So the last part I'm gonna talk about is brain imaging outcomes. And um, the way that we measured this was using something called diff diffusion tensor imaging. How many are familiar with diffusion tensor imaging? Okay, so this is a, the best sort of schematic that I could find that helped me to understand it. So what we're looking at is tracks. So this is, um, A is, Tra a normal track, so look at this as a corticospinal track, and diffusive tensor imaging is looking at the movement of water molecules. So these blue circles here are water mo molecules. So in a normal track, there's something called fractional anisotropy and FA, and that's the structural integrity of that track. The red arrows show that movement of the water molecules is in one clear direction, and the fibers are fairly organized. They're fairly lined up, these, this movement of water. Now, RD is radial, which means perpendicular diffusion, so it's the movement in the green going up and down, perpendicular. Um, and on the outside of tracks is something called myelin. And I think you've heard of myelin before. It's on nerves and it helps the nerve propagate down like a, to um, increase the speed. So that's how you transmit the signals from your brain to your muscle. And the, when you're, the myelin creates a physiological barrier here so that there isn't too much movement in this area, in these green arrows. Then there's also AD, which is parallel diffusion, which is sort of like looking at this direction, similar to FA. And then there's an MD, which is mean diffusion, which is the average of R, RD and AD. If we look at a damage track, diffusion is in many directions, isn't it? And there's a loss of fiber organization. They're not lined up in the same way. So FA decreases in a damaged track then RD actually increases because this interference of myelin has been damaged. So there's more movement radially, and that increases. So that measure increases. And those are the two measures that's sort of more clear to explain. AD is also diffusion is less parallel, sort of like what we saw with FA. So now this is because it's very, it is very complicated. And um, this is done here at UCLA in the Brain uh, Mapping Center. So the child gets an MRI, and then also with the MRI, we can look at this diffusion, special imaging sequences. It goes into this pipeline, it comes out with tensors, which are sort of these, or these diffusion in different directions, which then are placed on the MRI so that we can have a picture. And then all this math is telling us whether it's moving perpendicular or parallel or somewhere in between. So that we can, to use math mathematically, we can come up with whether, um, what our values are for FA, um, RD, and AD, and then take the average for MD. So the method that we used was track-based spatial, spatial statistics, it's called. So it's looking at these like little voxels. Rather than looking at just the long track itself, we look at it by little voxels. They're sort of like, you might think about pixels on your screen. So these are like sort of the pixels of the MRI. And within each voxel, we look at pre-post changes or correlations within the voxel. And then if they're significant, then they're projected onto this skeleton shown here in green in different colors. So again, we're gonna look at this picture that we had before that we all understand now, looking at corticospinal tracts, the brain cross section. And here are our MRIs with the diffusion mapping on it. So we're looking at cerebral palsy, so there's damage in this area. And what we see here is everywhere where there's decreased structural integrity, which is red, it means the control group that we had had greater FA compared to the CP group. And we can see this within the cortical spinal tracts on the, on the right and on the left, but we see it other, other places, don't we? Because they have brain damage not just limited to the cortical spinal tracts.
Um, and then here, when we look at um, RD, we found that RD, that the control group RD was uh, lower compared to the CP group. So it was increased in the CP group, so it's shown here in blue. And we can see that there's a lot of loss of myelination throughout the brain, but definitely in the corticospinal tracts as well. The next question was, does the structure of the corticospinal tracts correlate with our scale, our clinical measure? And we did see that it, indeed it did. And this is interesting because it was the leg. This is the leg tract. This is where you, if you stimulated this part of your cortex, you would get uh, muscle activity in your leg. Um, and then this is the hand over here. But that we see that there, it did correlate with structural integrity, or FA. So the red of the areas where FA increases with scale score. So those children who had higher scale scores had higher FA. So it did correlate. Our scale assessment was a nice clinical correlate of actual corticospinal tract damage. Now, um, the big question that we're all leading up to is, would there be changes in the corticospinal tracts after our camp leg power? And there are some changes. They're less subtle than looking at all the damage throughout the brain. But we did see that myelination improved. So here is we saw some myelination here in the corticospinal tracts and also here. And that makes sense because it's pretty hard to change the structure of something in a short intervention of 15 sessions. But changing the myelination is something that can occur. So we also see MD, which is the average of RD and AD. We see that bilaterally, too. And we even see some more up here closer to the cortex. Now, I'm just, I've been trying to stick to one view because we get many different views that we look at and lots of axial slices. Um, but I do want to show you one more view where you can see um, some positive changes as well. This is if I'm looking at the top of this boy's head and I took a cross-sectional area in this direction, the slice. So this is the front looking forward, and then this is the back of the brain. And here, also, we can see evidence of improvement in the corticospinal tracts. And this is the posterior limb of the internal capsule. We also see some anteriorly, which is more to do with sensory. And then we also see some improvement in the inter interbrain coordination, which may have to do with interlimb coordination. We see that for RD and for MD, and that is also evidence of significant increases in myelination with our camp like power. So we're very excited to see that. Um, so our summary is that we found significant reduction in structural integrity of myelination of the corticospinal tracts in the cerebral palsy group as compared to our typically developing control group. Children with greater selective motor control exhibited greater structural integrity of the corticospinal tracts. We found evidence of neuroplasticity following our camp leg power, and the changes in the corticospinal tracts were consistent with increased myelination. Um, we're currently recruiting a no camp control group to rule out that any of the changes could be due to maturation. But you could see that, unlike the other brain images that we saw, they were limited to the, more limited to the corticospinal tract. So it, it does seem that we were focused in that area. Now, what about future research? Well, we're looking at kids that really don't have that much ability to change. Um, that mirror is so strong, we can give them all the feedback, but I think they're just hardwired at this point. Um, myelination does continue on through teenage years, so that is the good news, but early intervention is where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck, is to say. So, um, Premature babies with corticospinal drugs, uh, spinal cord damage can improve selective motor control. And this is some work being done by uh, Dr. Sargent at USC. And she let me have one of her slides here. And this is a mobile above. And it's triggered to activate if the baby's foot with the sensor crosses this line. And in order for the baby to get um, their foot above this line, they need to flex the hip and extend the knee. And babies are able to learn this within one session. And with practice, they get better. So we know that they can improve. So that's one um, intervention that we know of. And um, if we could get better contra limb coordination or control, perhaps we could prevent some of the developing of mirroring or that abnormal plasticity that we see.
Uh, there's also people that are doing studies in the cortex doing stimulation. Um, and there's some animal studies that have shown that if you do that, you do um, increase the contralateral um, connections and, and some of the ipsilateral fade away. And then also, I think, just taking a, a, a better look at ankle fortifoses, um, I know that our orthopedic cons surgeon in clinic, uh, Dr. Thompson, is, uh, you know, gives people advice not to have these braces on all the time. Sometimes a brace will be given to a child that's a toddler, and they'll be playing on the floor, and they'll be able to run, and the parent will say, you know, now they have this brace, they can't get up the floor, up off the floor, and I have to pick them up to get them in standing. And so I think that we need to have some use of orthotics. They're really important um, for some children more than other, others um, that have poor balance, but that they should always have time without bracing, uh, especially so they can develop sensory motor activities. Just um, wanted to acknowledge um, everybody who contributed. You can see that these kinds of research studies are just are, take a lot of effort. For Camp Leg Power, um, this is our UCLA research team. Our camp counselors were primarily UCLA undergraduates who are um, interested in pursuing a, a career in physical therapy, occupational therapy, or as physicians. And we also had some medical students who spent their summer with us. And we had additional physical therapists that helped out. And it takes a lot of funding as well. And I also wanted to have a special shout out to our imaging research team. Uh, Andy Vuong's here. He's a Tarzan Center trainee. And um, uh, my PhD student who's doing his dissertation work in the imaging. Uh, Dr. Uh, Josai in uh, Brain Mapping Center, who um, was uh, integral to all of our imaging work. Dr. Matsumoto, who is a UCLA pediatric neurologist. And Loretta Stout, who's part of our team um, in the Center for CP and also at UCLA Pediatrics. And definitely want to thank all the children and families who participated in this study. It was a fun camp, but they really had to come to all these evaluations and imaging sessions, so we, we couldn't do, that, do this without them, obviously. And I want to thank you for your attention. Anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, so I'm going to ask you a hard question of the variable you didn't measure. Um, I see the improvement, and it's really wonderful. Do you think it translated to improvement in quality of life? Well, we um, we did take some quality of life measures with the children. Just um, it, it was a peds. QL. I haven't finished looking through all that data yet, but we didn't see a change with that. Um, but it sort of asks things like, are you happy? Are you, it, it's pretty vague. I think maybe something that's a little bit more tailored um, would be better. And also, I think, you know, they were very excited the first day we gave them, they were starting camp, and then we gave them to them again, like the last day of, of camp. So, you know, maybe that's not the best time to give somebody health-related quality of, of life measures. But, and they also had some questions about school in there, so I want to go back and look to see if, see obviously they weren't in school, so, uh, and they might have been in school afterwards, so I want to look at how those, those questions were evaluated as well. That's a good question. Question. Um, well, first of all, excellent talk. Thank you so much for, for someone who doesn't know much about this field. Um, I always appreciate how you're able to talk about this in, in lay terms that I can understand. So thank you for that. Um, I'm really curious about Camp Leg Power, and I really want to revisit the idea about also incorporating maybe some social skills training in your camp, potentially, to, you know, speaking of quality of life. And then you mentioned in the past that a lot of the kids just appreciate being around other kids with right. some challenges. And right. you know, there's a lot of um, you know, isolation, social isolation in this population and a lot of issues around social skills. That actually wasn't my question, but I just want to pitch that again to you. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to answer, address that first, though, yeah. is I think that it would be an excellent control group because maybe we'd see a different part of the brain that would improve with the social skills training. And I have thought about it. I think that a lot of times, the, you know, even though I think my children could have used some of the social skills training that you do with like bullying and everything, I mean, it's really incredible. But a lot of parents, um, you know, if they have an intellectual disability, then they kind of key in that they have problems. Um, but 
you know, even though it might be helpful, but I do think like some sort of a camp where we incorporated some of that um, would be a great opportunity and might be a good control for um, the motor task. That wasn't actually my question, though. But my question actually relates to the robots that are used. And even before you showed the video of using the robot, where it was sort of um, helping the child, I guess, to sort of learn to walk in the proper way. I oh, guess. the robotics, yeah. What I was kind of curious about is, is there any training where the robot sort of um, won't move unless they move their body in the proper way? Almost like if you're riding a bike, it's not going to move unless you sort of pedal in the correct motion. Is there any training like that where mm -hmm. the device will not move unless they're, they're sort of moving their body in the proper way with their hips and their... Yeah, there's a lot of robotics out there. There isn't one that's specifically designed for selective motor control. I have talked to some people in robotics about that. Um, there are some of those. So there's one that I, I know like a colleague developed, and it's for trying to help a child to crawl. So it's like a little skateboard. And if the child doesn't initiate, the skateboard won't do anything, right. but it will move if the child moves. But I think that is a really good point. We do look at, um, for that particular one, that robot, it's really for, um, you have to be a certain height to have that robot. The pediatric legs, which are smaller, we have sort of more like teenage to adult size legs. So those children understood what we wanted and they got feedback from a screen that told them how much torque they were developing. And it could be in smiley faces, it could be in like a temperature gauge, or it could be in you know, actual units of torque, whatever they wanted. So they got some feedback, but I do think that that is true. Um, that if over ground would be better and also um, that they'd need to initiate. Yeah, that maybe they could actually be building. Right. So, sometimes what um, people use also is functional electrical stimulation. So you put the electrodes on, and it's not strong enough to really cause a contraction. But it gives them like feedback. So especially with dorsiflexion, that there's been su su some success with that, where you kind of stimulate the muscle, and then that sort of triggers them to move on more of a subconscious level. But robots are very challenging because once you get out of like a constrained system, it's really hard to functionally do it. So most of these robots are just used in therapy. And the one that I showed you, one of the sales pitches is that, uh, you know, you don't need a therapist. You just put the person, well, we didn't need a therapist. We needed two therapists and an engineer to operate the computer because we had to have one person by the button to make sure to shut it off if they had any problems and another one to make sure that everything was moving and so it was you know these robots have a long way to go I mean someday we'll get there but um, yeah uh, oh, get me first and I'll get you well. Um, so how are you deciding on what areas of focus for kids with CP like you talked about you're looking at the lower legs. What makes you decide that you're going to investigate a certain area and research? That's a good question. Um, with my back flu, it has to be like who who do you have? Like here at UCLA, we're great that we have so many different disciplines and people and imaging and all that that we can um, draw from. But my back in um, biomechanics, and I run a gait and motion analysis laboratory in a CP. A lot of the patients that I have coming through have cerebral palsy and have a gait problem and are able to walk. So that's sort of the population that I work with. So that's what stimulates the questions because they're in front of me. And I have the tools to be able to look at changes. But um, in the broader context of being like the director of research and education for our center, we do do a lot of other things like we do outreach with women who have cerebral palsy, um, who are trying to access uh, OBGYN care and just have physical barriers and also attitudinal barriers. We're also doing something with adaptive gaming. We worked with Microsoft and helped uh, give input to the new adaptive controller that they have. And so we're trying to get that out into this California Children's Services. Uh, so we try to do some things that are sort of um, uh, advocacy and implementation, as well as sort of more our strict kind of research kinds of tools. But we're always open for suggestions. And also what we can get funding for. So we did a lot of good ideas that never got funded. That's one of the big things. All right, and oh, Will. So my question has to do with the limitations of the study. 
Yes. Besides the individuals who couldn't participate in the study because of the MRI, um, were there other limitations of the study? Well, um, so that was the MRI part. So those are 12 children out of the 23 that we were able, that, so those that couldn't. Um, well, limitation of the study, let's say other limitations scientifically would be, you know, maturation. So that's why we'd like a control group, because we'd like to say, well, what, how, how much change might we see just with time? It was only 15, you know, it was just one month, but still we could have changes. Um, the Children, some of the children uh, did have mild intellectual disabilities, which makes it harder to follow directions, or also they were younger, um, and it's harder for them to follow directions and be as focused. I think that something like the ankle robot they did well in regardless, but yeah. So those are the kind of limitations? Yeah, okay. Yes? You said you did it for three summers? Yes. Did any of the children come back consecutive? Yes, we had uh, three children that came back consecutive summers, so we just used the data from one sum one of the summers, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Would you want to see? See change, yeah. Well, the, the children that came back consecutive years, if they were different than the group, maybe that just came one summer. Well, that's good, but it would be like an individual case studies rather than a group. If we had a larger group, we, we could. They certainly got better at... Um, Laying still the MRI, and we, like we didn't get an MRI one year on one, but we did the next time. I think, you know, things like that. So, yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Yeah.